Good evening. Let's get started this evening. We're going to do a song in just a few minutes. Uh, we welcome everybody to the service, and those of you who are watching by Facebook Live and by YouTube, we welcome you also. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. We had so many announcements this morning. I, we usually don't do it that way, but we just had it so much. We got some testimonies tonight from the guys who went to the prayer retreat at the camp these last few days, and they uh, had a great time. We all had We had about 10 of our guys go with us. It was really great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. This weekend at the camp, they've got college career retreat, and then also next two Saturdays from this past Saturday, the 21st, I think it is, uh, the Brett Rochester family is going to be at the camp for a senior day, for senior day. And it's going to be from 10 to 3. We'll leave the church about 8.30. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to get there, an hour and 15 back, of course. And looking forward. I hope you'll go with us. It's, now, seniors, it's $35. If someone is a senior cannot afford it, you let us know. You, I want you to go. I don't want anybody to miss out on it. It is a tremendous time. You get to see the camp and the beauty of the camp. They have a 20-room motel there. They've got a beautiful um, 1850s mansion on the river with a colonial Williamsburg-type bedrooms and furniture. It's just a beautiful place to go over and at least take a look at it. They have a beautiful lodge, log cabin lodge, just gorgeous. Uh, if you've never been to the camp, you'll want to go. And the dining hall is like seats 300 in there. Um, so I want to invite everybody as a senior to come and go with us. Those of you who may be watching by Facebook Live and you'd like to go, please uh, call the office and Amy will help you get set up. It's 35 a person. They feed us a little bit of a light breakfast when we get there. And then they're going to have prime rib for lunch. Amen. Well, my wife is excited. She's going to go. Prime rib for lunch. Okay, it should be good. The food at this camp. Carrie told me, and Carrie and my, and my daughter Amy have been to the wilds many times, and nothing against the wilds. I thank God for the wilds because it helped make a big difference in my children. Right. Camp will make a difference in your kids. Amen. Camp will make a difference in adults. Right. Amen. I saw it these past few days. Okay? So um, please come on out for that. Um, this Thursday is what I need you the most for. We are going to have Wednesday night services. Promise Seekers with the children will have their thing. And then in, we'll have three preach, two or three preachers out here in the auditorium, about 10-minute preachers. We've been doing that and have, of course, our prayer time together. Um, but on Thursday night, uh, it's God and Country Night. This is a rare thing that we're having here. God and Country Night. Evangelist Byron Fox has crisscrossed this nation. Uh, Brother Fox uh, held a God and country, what is it, not revival, when he goes, God bless, God bless America crusades. He went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and s probably 60, 70, 80 churches got involved, and 5,000 people came out to the crusade. Here in Hampton, about, I guess, 12 years ago, it was done over here by the Hampton Coliseum. What's the, what's the building next to it? Convention, Convention Center. Two to 3,000 of folks around this area came out to it. Byron is heavily involved in seeing revival in America. But this particular meeting, this Thursday at 7 o'clock, is going to be, what can we do now in praying for our nation? But also, other things are going to bring out some, some what can we go from here in uh, the world of, of course, uh, the political world? And what can Christians, how can we get involved and in all that? Chad Connolly will be with him. Chad Connolly was the, for two years, the um, president, I guess called president, of the Republican Party in South Carolina. He then became, when President Trump became president, he became the liaison to churches nationally. It's the first time a president has ever had anybody as a liaison to churches in America here, as far as we know. And so, he will be with us, and he and Byron Fox crisscrossed the nation, went to many churches, talked to many pastors. They rallied the folks. They gained 70,000 new registered voters to, uh, to go to vote. So these folks are on top of it. Uh, Brother John Godfrey pastors over at Great Hope Baptist Church in Chesapeake. He'll probably give about a 15-minute devotion. Brother John is a tremendous pastor. They've got about, uh, I think, uh, 300 folks in the church. They got a Christian school. He's 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 just took over. His dad pastored it for many years and has uh, retired from the ministry. And now John has stepped in, and they're going great guns over there. 
All right, just something really spiritual. Here you go. Mom, where do people come from? Asked little Susie. Mom thought her daughter was a bit too young to hear about the facts of life, so she answered, Well, the Bible says that God made people from the dust of the earth. Several weeks later, little Susie asked, Mom, what happens to people when they die? Mom thought her daughter was still a little bit too young to hear about the reality of death, so she answered, Well, the Bible says that when people die, they return to dust. Two days later, little Susie came running down the stairs shouting, Quick, Mom, quick, come upstairs. I just looked under my bed and there's someone either coming or going. <laughs> Spiritual thing, right? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. You go ahead and take your song books and turn to 586 with me. Are you on five? Yes, he, she is. All right, 586. Glory to his name. If you'll stand up with me, we're going to sing this out loud together. The first, second, and last verse. Amen. Down at the cross. Here we go. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Now when we're cleansing from sin, I cried. There to my heart was the blood of be saved tonight. Amen. Praise God. Stay standing with me. Turn to 365. 365. We're going to get over there. This I just wanted to sing a little bit tonight. Amen. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We're going to do that first, second, and last verse also. 365. Here we go. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Very good singing tonight. 
I'm going to ask Brother Daniel to come, and he is going to, we've got, I think some guys maybe going to give testimonies tonight of what took place at the camp. We have the privilege tonight of having Pastor Richard Baird and his wife and family with him tonight, and he's got a sportsman rally. He's going to tell you about that. I'm not going to steal your thunder on that. We announced it this morning, too, so, this morning, so he's going to do that, and he's going to preach to us tonight. This past Friday, we had the privilege to go over to the Tidewater Baptist Fellowship meeting. He hosted it at the church at South Key Baptist Church. Anybody ever heard of South Key? Besides me saying it from the pulpit, you've heard of South Key? Okay. Some of you, of course, have been over, and we've done the walkthrough journey through Christmas and, and been a uh, time there just rejoicing, have a good time working, serving with them. Um, but anyway, we had a good time. Brother Richard preached the first message there, and another brother this, preached the second one. And I went up to Richard. I said, would you feel led to come and, and maybe preach that message for tonight. I don't know if he's doing I think he's going to do that. But if he doesn't, he preached something else. I know it'll be from God's word. Rich is a good preacher. Um, and so he's going to preach tonight. And so, Daniel, why don't you come on? Where'd he go? Right. He's right behind me. How do you like a man that can dress in purple and wear purple ties and purple shirts and, and all that? I kind of like it. Anyway. You know, purple's a biblical color. Yes, it is. So it's okay to wear it. Hey, don't think I forgot. How many uh, seeds have you sown this month so far? All right. We're going to take some numbers real quick if that's all right with you. I'll sure. take a couple, couple of minutes. I got my pen here. Carrie has two. Carrie has two. Eli has two. Remember, we're going for that classic New Testament soul winner's Bible. Miss Dawn, two. That's uh, up until this, this time, this month. Now, next time I come up, it'll probably be next Sunday morning. You tell me how many, time, or how many tracks you've handed out since now until next Sunday morning. All right. How many else we got? We got over here? Crystal. I really didn't count, but uh, around 6,700. Give you the benefit of the doubt. Call it 10. All right. Yes. Got one? Wonderful. Amen. All right, who else? Yes, yeah, Miss Melissa. One. All right. Sometimes all it takes is one. Ah, let me clarify. From March 1st, since the whole month is track month, from March 1st, how many of these did you hand out? Five. All right. No, it's any track. How many tracks did you? We, we just put these together because they're really cool. It has a pack of seeds on them. It says, come grow with us. And this is our church track. But it don't matter. You can hand out any track. All right. Who else? I'm going to stay over here. Yes, Eric. Um, uh, probably at least six. Okay. We'll call it six. Remember, God knows. So. <laughs> Who else? Amy. Five. Five. Hey, making me turn all the way around. Coming back this way. Yes. Amen. Woo! All right. Amen. Well, I am not going to tell you to slack off. <laughs> Don't slow down for our sakes, okay? <laughs> All right. Keep on going. Right. 24. Woo. All right. Now, Mr. Daniel, are we going to have like a list next Sunday they can put down how many they did? Or are we going to do just from the pulpit? I like keep on doing it from the pulpit. I have a tally. If you didn't know, I know a little bit about how to use Excel, so I'll punch these into Excel so I know how many numbers you got. So don't try to fake it. Don't try to tell me, oh, I passed out 67 this month when I know you passed out so many so far. Okay, not unless you did pass out 67 that week then, you know, praise God, I'll order 2,500 more. Amen. All right? So make me order more tracks. That's the whole plan. Amen. So, all right, wonderful. We got all the track tallies. Now, as I said before, if you didn't come to the Mountain Moving Prayer Advance, Retreat, Conference, whatever you want to call it, we got together and we prayed, and we learned how to pray, then you missed out. 
And I spoke a little bit myself of what God did in my heart and in my family and started getting new habits, um, just revitalizing our prayer life, which is so essential when you're trying to walk with God. And I got two more men that want to come up and give testimonies, and that is Mr. Jerry and Mr. Brian. Okay, Eli, you want to give one? Okay. I mean, we're going to have to pare it down a little bit if we've got three guys up here doing is it. Is so. time limit? <laughs> Jerry and Brian? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Brian you want your marker board up here <laughs> all right all right so these men are going to come up and and I like doing this for for meetings and I like pastor getting us up here and talk and having us give testimonies after meetings like this and ladies I don't remember testimonies y'all gave after the ladies retreat I think we need to have that again after y'all go the men are up here doing all the talking and that's all right um, we're going to have Eli come up first, and after Eli, then uh, either Jerry or Brian, whichever one you want to go, and uh, we're just going to tell you what God has shown us, and believe me, I don't doubt that you ladies are sharing God's word. You're doing that at your homes with your husbands and things like that. I'm just, I'm just joking. I know with Mary, uh, she's not in here right now, with her handing out 44 tracks, yeah. I'm being blown away. <laughs> I thought I was doing good. I got 14. She had about 44. <laughs> All right, Eli. Come on. Hey, God. Um, God bless my heart. While we were at the um, at the Mountain Moving Prayer Retreat um, on Friday, he talked about um, Pastor Thomas. All of us talked about the cleansing protocol. How each prayer warrior should have an up-to-date account on um, Lord. I did this. Please forgive me. I said this, please forgive me. I was short with this person, please forgive me. When sins stack up, that doles the effectiveness of a prayer warrior. Um, <clears throat> he had us get alone for an hour that day and just go through the sweet hour of prayer pamphlet um, he had. And that was a wonderful experience. God was working on my heart um, pretty heavily when we were going through that he's saying okay Eli now we have communication channel back open you have your um, <clears throat> forgiveness account up to date if you will so now you can start receiving now you can start being able to more readily receive my will for your life we were getting ready for the next session and the Crown College kids saying preach the word and God was saying, hey, Eli, I want you in ministry. I want you as a full-time servant. I'm not going to tell you what right now, but um, I know that I surrendered for full-time to be a full-time servant Amen. for God Amen. when we were at that Amen. conference. Amen. Praise God. Deal with that thing right now. <laughs> What's that? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> we'll get we'll get by with that in drawings. I think tonight. Now it's uh, well, when we went there. It's uh, it was quite a blessing going to this thing. I have to I have to tell you, it really was. I didn't have the uh, greatest of expectations when we went in. It was me and I brought my two boys. And where'd the other one go? <laughs> yeah. So prime example. Anyhow, uh, it got to be a little bit frustrating. They were the two youngest there, so, you know, and I wanted them to listen. The reason that I really wanted to go to this was for them to listen and to pay attention to what's going on the whole time we were there. And uh, we got through four or five sessions, and, you know, every night or every opportunity we had, we got together to pray, and I was like, so what are you guys learning? What are you saying? We don't remember, and it's just like, I mean, it gets really frustrating the whole time, so that really wore on me. The bright spot was that I could see other men and how God was working in their lives, and that was quite a blessing, so I have to say that. The best part, well, not the best part, but one of the best parts is that, uh, like I said, we went through five of the six sessions, and then we had a uh, campfire meeting, which was pretty neat, too. And after the meeting, um, Tristan comes up out of nowhere, to let me know, hey, Daddy, thank you for bringing us. And it was Amen. genuine Amen. and sincere. It was innocent. And 
man, that's right when I was said to God, I was like, you just completed the whole trip for me. I, all of this frustration just to this point, it was like, it's, it's all worth it now. Everything is perfect. But then we had the whole next day to go. So not that that's a bad thing, but we, have, we were allowed five minutes up here, okay? The reason I'm going to stop early is because I'm going to give the rest of my time to my brother Jerry. And that's what I wanted to do. That's why I wanted to go. That's why I wanted to go first, because I wanted to give you that time. Like I said, to see God work in other men's lives, and this is one of them. You know, being, being jovial, you already break me down there, brother. I'm sorry. I get that thing out of here, you guys. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. And, and I'll reiterate things that have already been said. The the conference itself, the design of the conference. Having men, young young men, preteens, teenagers, Cameron and Caden blessed me with their with their fellowship the whole time, and there were some frustrating times there too. I assure you, but we all got through and we all grew, and I saw I saw growth in in the boys. And one of the conversations that we had with Brian is that he's saying, hey, you know, I'm not so sure how they're getting it. I said, they're not sure how much they're getting. It. I said, you know, two percent is better, and better is good, and good becomes great, and great becomes godly. And who knows what will happen when you get godly, right? Whew. Man, what a powerful time we had. So Thursday night was, all, was amazing. We saw all these kids come together. We saw men come together. And I say kids because I probably was the, I was probably the biggest kid there. <laughs> My body told me later, you're an old man. Remember that. <laughs> so I am thankful that I was able to, to enjoy some of the festivities with the guys. And I'm sorry I'm up here shaking. I don't know how you do this all the time. Uh, and Pastor even said, you know, if we can get up there and get a chance, and I appreciate the extra minutes, Brian, because you know I'm going to use them. And I'm sorry, but you all did this to yourselves. <laughs> and I'll explain why in a minute. <clears throat> Pastor said, you know, let's give a five-minute testimony. Okay, here I go. <laughs> Buckle up. I'm going to jump ahead to Saturday because it was just a Friday, or Thursday afternoon, Friday, and a Saturday thing. And Saturday... We were sitting in there, and we were in session number seven. And there was an offering plate that was passed around for a particular reason. And I had a burden on my heart for this exact subject. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, you just got a big gift that was absolutely unexpected. And I quickly pulled out my phone. I said, Erica, my wife, I said, Erica, I said, Miss, sorry, I really want to give. I, I, we don't need this. The Lord has blessed us. The Lord has always blessed us. And I said, I'm thinking about this much. And as soon as I got done typing, I said, you know what? Double that. I'm thinking about this much. And I sat down, and, and in my chair, I was like, okay, that's, that's what I want to do, but I don't have that cash in my pocket. So I went up, and I spoke to Scott, and I said, Scott, I want to be able to give, and I don't know how to give, so let's do this afterwards. And he said, okay, great. And they got done, and they said, okay, we're doing this, and we started singing and things, and I started thinking in my heart, I was like, man, I said, I know I could do just a little bit more. I know I can. We've been blessed. We, we really have. And so I'm sitting to myself, I said, maybe I should pull Pastor aside and say, Pastor, is there any way, like, if I can get this much, I said, then the other half is here. Maybe we can get together with the church, or general funds and all those kinds of things. And I thought, and I stopped, and I said, this is not the church's burden. The Lord has placed this burden on me. And I truly never understand true burden until Saturday morning. I never really understood true burden until Saturday afternoon. And so I stopped and I said, okay. And so I was like, you know what? I texted my wife and I said, hey, double or triple that. We're going big or we're not going at all. And my loving, gracious, God-fearing woman said, whatever you want to do, I trust you. Thank God for my wife. And so we came up there, and Pastor or Brother Byron was, was about to sing, and he said, hey, the update is we, we received this much money. And I said, we got the rest. And we is my wife and me and God Almighty. He has blessed us. But he taught me the lesson of selfless giving. And it's a lesson that is going to change. It has changed my life. It's going to change my life. 
And I don't know what it's going to do tomorrow, but I'm excited for it. You're laughing at me right now, and I know why. Because she told me a couple of weeks ago, she said, when God gets a hold of your heart, she said, I want to be there. Well, ma'am, I was tossing and turning last night till 1.30 in the morning. And I remember seeing you right there. And I remember seeing you right there and you right there. And you were over here, Brian, or Daniel. And then, of course, Brian was in the back. So you need to move over if we're going to make this complete. <laughs> And my wife was joking me because I was moving around and kicking around so much. She said, you know, if you kick me one more time, I'm, I'm getting out of bed and I'm going to go to sleep over here. So she told me that this morning, but we're both tired because I was wrestling with things. And what I was wrestling with is, how do I stop thanking God? That's what kept me up all night. Until 1.30 in the morning. I went to bed. I turned the lights out. I went to bed. I went, put my little mask machine on, right? And I suppose you should be out. Mm -mm. God's like, we got business. God, did he work on my heart. And it wasn't last night. That was your three minutes, right? Okay. Now, my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Friday. Pastor Byron said and Brother Tom, they said, sweet hour of prayer. This is your challenge. This little bitty pam pamphlet that we've been talking about not that big, right? But there's a lot of writing on there. And all this is, is question after question after question. How do you feel about this? How do you think about this? Have you done right here? Where do you stand with this? And I said, talk to God for an hour? Never done it. I have never talked to God for a solid hour in my whole life. I've talked to God for plenty of hours throughout my life. But I have never sat down and talked to God for a full hour. So he said, go find a good place, and there's 283 acres, so there's plenty of property out there, so everybody found a corner, and I know where he was at because there was a big puddle of tears underneath the table where Daniel was praying for an hour. <laughs> and we joke him about it, but what a, loving, what a loving concept that is that a man would cry in front of his almighty creator. But it's not a cry of pain or anything other than just appreciation, I'm sure. And I wasn't in your head, but, I, but we've talked. And it's the same thing that Brian was doing, the same thing I was doing, the same thing 40 or 50 other men, women, or men and boys were doing. And one of the things that we talked about is how God can have 40 men talking to God all at the same time. He's like, yeah, just keep on talking. I got it all. I can hear you all. I'm answering all your thoughts. I'm taking care of all your prayers. I've got all your needs handled. Mm -hmm. And we're surprised at that. And Brother Tom Alva said, God wasn't. He knew it was happening. He knew it was going to happen. He knew this prayer retreat was going to happen, this prayer advance. And he knew how I was going to come out of this. And I'm so thankful for a God that knows all. I'm so thankful for a God of free will. And I sat down, and there was a park bench in front of the little pond. And I said, you know, that's a good place for me. And so I sat down there, and it was a beautiful morning. And I said, hmm, how do I do this, right? Well, good thing is all the directions are right here. <laughs> and I'm okay reading directions. I could even figure out a few. And so it started, and one of the big things, he says, make sure you don't skip any steps. Don't take any shortcuts. Spend an hour with God. <sighs> okay. Like I said, never done it before. But I'm willing to try. So I sat there. And I went through all the steps, and I got a little ways down here, and all of a sudden, my mind started drifting. And I said, man, I really want to stay focused on this, but my mind kept drifting. And I think any Christian has that struggle when you sit down to read the Word of God. And so I paused briefly, and I said, Lord God, I said, I know this is the devil not wanting me to do this, not wanting me to finish this one-hour exercise that I'm determined to do. So please take the... Lord, just take the devil out of my head. Let me stay focused on this. Please let me do this. And as I finished that prayer, it just became clear. And I kept reading. And I kept reading. And it says worship. And then it says praise. And then it says confess. And boy, that got deep. <laughs> then he starts asking all these questions about what have you done to this person? What have you done to that person? Have you caused any ill will? Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you not done this? Have you done what you're supposed to do? Have you not done what you're not supposed to do? 
And I honestly answered every one of those to the best of my ability. And it's only God, right? I can't be embarrassed about talking about God, to God, about anything in my life, because guess what? He already knows. He's just waiting for me to admit it. Thank the, God, thank, thank the Lord, right? So I sat there, and we got to the part where it got done fishing all the questions, and you turn it over, and it says pray. That's step number four, and that's the last step in here, pray. And when we talked about the power of prayer and how to pray, stop asking for God for blessings. And when you're praying, just thank God. Just thank God. And so I said, you know, I'm trying to learn all this stuff, all the sessions one through four got us here. Let me just thank God. So I closed my eyes. All right, and we're supposed to be doing this for an hour. I was like, whew, man, I hope this goes along faster. I'm starting to get worried. I'm not going to have enough to talk about in an hour. And so I started thanking God, and, of course, I start with my family. I start with my beautiful wife, and I start thanking God for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon me with her. I'm not sure when your blessings are going to come, because I know I'm blessed having you, but I guess yours are going to come later, maybe in heaven or something. I'm not sure what's going on. You got the raw end of that deal, lady, but uh, sure, I sure appreciate what he's done for us. But um, um, see, now I know what it is when I heckle you from out there. That is incredible. I get it now. I get it. Boy, this is just a day of enlightening, right? So I sat there on the park bench, and I started thanking God. And I continued to thank God. And I continued to thank God. And I started thinking about what I hadn't thought about yet, and I thank God for reminded me those things that I hadn't thought about yet, and I started thanking God again. And I kept thanking God, and I kept thanking God. And a little while later, I started hearing this ruffling of feathers or leaves and stuff behind me, and people were walking back, and I said, man, I said, the hour must be up. And I kept thanking God. And I kept thanking God. And I couldn't get off that bench. And I kept thanking God. And some footsteps drew nearer, and a ruffling of the leaves got better. And I felt this, this weight on the bench next to me. It was Brother Brian. And he just sat there. He didn't say a word to me. And what I know is that that's a brother in Christ just supporting me. He didn't have to say a word. He just sat there and supported me. And I looked up, and I recognized it was him. And I said, Brother Brian, I said, I don't understand this. I said, I've been thanking God, and I've been talking to God, and I've been answering all these questions, and I've been thanking God, and I've been thanking God, and apparently this hour is up, and I'm still on my family. I hadn't even gotten to the pond or the trees or the leaves or the sunlight, and don't even get started with me on that powerful breeze that one day that knocked the acorn out of the tree and landed on a pile of dirt that the Lord God himself breathed life into it when he created the earth. That water would fall on that acorn, that sunlight would hit it, and it would grow into a tree. And don't, don't let me even start talking about thankful that the man that wanted to harvest that tree to take it to the sawmill. That some other person wanted to get up out of bed and go to the sawmill to operate that saw and cut that tree into a whole bunch of two by fours and other different things just so he could put it on a truck and another truck driver wanted to that day get up out of bed and drive that to the lumber store so that the man that I hadn't even met yet or don't even know who was decided to sit down and pencil out a little sketch of a design and he went to the lumber store and he picked up that lumber and he came back and he built the bench that I'm sitting on that day. Don't even get me started on thanking God. Two months ago, I'd have told you I could do this in five minutes. If somebody says, hey, I'm going to give you five minutes, I'm going to get up there, I'm going to talk to you. I'd like you to give a testimony, and I want you to talk about God. And I'll say, you know, I can do that. I'm here to tell you, you want to talk to me about God? Pack a lunch. 
maybe even a change of clothes, <laughs> pull up a chair, that we're going to be here for a while. Amen. Praise God. My God, I can't stop thanking him. And I asked Brian, I said, Brian, how am I supposed to do this? I can't stop thanking him. And I wasn't trying to be a spectacle to anybody in that building. And I started hearing music was playing. Brian was gone. And I'm still thanking God. And I haven't even started on the pond and the sunlight and the wind and the leaves and all of that. I just kept putting that in my head. And I said, dear God, how am I going to stop? And here's the answer. I'm not. I can't. I shouldn't. And if there's breath in me, I won't. And you want to talk to me about God? Pack a lunch. You reap what you sow, sir. Be careful now. You've unleashed me. Where's the bell? <laughs> no, sir. I want to thank everybody in this room and those that aren't here tonight. You are not my church family. You are my family. I'm so thankful each and every one of you. Some I don't even know that well, and I'm sorry that I haven't met you, but trust me, it's going to come. You may not like it when you get to meet me. <laughs> but at least there was this one moment where he said, gosh, he was a man of God for a little while. I don't know what God's going to do in my life next. And I used to say, hey, at least I'm taking baby steps and I'm heading in the right direction. And I'm doing things for God. No more baby steps for me. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know if he's going to change everything. I don't know if he's just going to just keep telling me to pray. And I'm okay for that. The Lord has blessed us, has blessed me, blessed me with all of you. And I won't stop thanking him for that. I never understood revival, and I started thinking about it. And I said, man, I said, look at this revival. And I, I looked up, and I realized I was in a mirror. I said, there's a heart being revived right now in front of me. Good God, the miracles that, 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 that he can work. Again, I don't know where it's going to lead. I'm excited for it. I know there's trials and tribulations ahead of me. But what's great about God is he will not test me greater than what I'm capable of. And I'm capable of anything with God, through God, because he is my God. And I know, and Mr. Tom Elvis said, he is your God too, but trust me when I tell you, he is my God, and I love my God. <sighs> Who's got five more minutes they can give me? <laughs> but Pastor, I thank you so much for your counsel, your mentorship, and I thank God for a, a man of God such as you. I thank Daniel and Brian and Brother Kerry and Eli and Brad and Al and Eric and Kevin and everybody else I can't remember right now because this is making me nervous. I don't normally get nervous easy. Thank you for letting me share. Thank God for changing my heart. And I thought I had a soft heart before. I didn't know it could get any better. I really did, and I'm not saying I was great. And this is only another baby step for him. <laughs> it's a leap and a bound for me. I heard terms like iron sharpeneth iron, and it was just something I'd heard every now and again. But in the last year, it's made a difference in my life. Can you imagine where we're going to be next year? <laughs> I feel sorry for y'all. <laughs> You're going to have to put up with me being on fire for God. Amen. I just really want to say thank you to everybody here. If you don't know God, you want to talk about God, you want to talk about what I'm talking about, you want to talk about this. And I even sent a message to Brother Byron today and Pastor Tom Alvis, and I said, you know, and I kind of gave him the short story of this because I can't type that long. And I told him, I said, you know, they said an hour of God, one sweet hour of prayer with God will change you. I said, how's one hour going to change me? Whew, man, I don't know nothing. 
One hour with God will change your life. And if you haven't done it, give it a try. Really sit down and honestly open yourself to God. The pamphlet is here. We can make a hundred, if not a thousand copies of it. I'm telling you, this changed my life. This just changed all y'all's life because it changed mine. And I know you're going to support me. I know you're going to pray for me. I'm going to fall. I'm going to stumble. But I've got a God that's going to pick me up every time. And he's going to thank me for trying. He's going to praise me for trying. And while I'm up here, as much as I don't, as much as I joke about everything, I want to thank God for my beautiful wife, my perfect mate. He knew when he brought her to me what I need. Thank you. Love you, lady. And I'm going to give out a few hugs because I don't think it's a bad thing for a man to hug another man. <laughs> yep, you get one too. Come on up. <laughs> All right, we're going to do one song tonight, um, then we're going to get Brother. Um, Pastor Barrett up here. If you'll turn to 634 with me. 634. Stand up with me. This might be a newer song for you. It's called Love Found a Way. Love Found a Way. Oh, praise his holy name. We're going to try this first verse together and uh, then we'll get into the preaching of the word of God tonight. All right? Wonderful love that rescued me sunk deep in sin Guilty and vile get Brother Barrett on to come on and preach to us. He's going to tell about what's happening over there at South Key this Saturday with the Sportsman's Banquet. And Brother Richard, we've got a bottle of water up here for you too. I promise you I didn't drink from it. Amen. Okay. All right. Okay. Father, thank you for the privilege to give. I pray you'll bless it, break it, use it, Lord, and further your kingdom, your gospel. In Jesus' name we do pray and love you. Amen. Brother Richard, why don't you come on?
I think you understand more why I say it is so important to get alone with God at a place, whether it's a camp or wherever. But uh, the, the reason I'm so pro-camp is because not only for our young people, whom I love greatly, but also our adults. In a matter of 48 hours, you watch the change of a man drastically. Six sessions. You, if you come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and you do that for two weeks, then you will have gotten six sessions. They had preaching for 48 hours, and God dealt with hearts. It is so important, I believe, because Satan's biggest thing he's doing in this day is distracting God's people away from the Lord. And if we can get folks under the sound of the word in a concentrated effort, I believe the Spirit of God will use that. You hear come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, between now and Wednesday, your mind is on so many other things. From Wednesday to the next Sunday, your mind is on so many other things. But if you give God six hours like that, something has to break inside. And the Spirit of God will use His Word, and God will... It, I felt like I was in the beginning stages of a revival. It was... Uh, I, I told them when we got near the end, I just wish we had two, three, four more days. So, next time we get the privilege of doing stuff like that, come on and go with us. Let God work on your heart and draw you closer to Him. He said, if you'll draw an eye to me, I'll draw an eye to you. I had a, a preacher who was a well-known preacher, and I saw the joy of God on his face. And I went up to him after the meeting, and I said, I want what you've got. He looked at me immediately. He spoke to me. He said, you can have it. I said, what do I have to do? He said, if you'll draw near to God, God will draw near to you. He said, if you'll draw a little bit, God will draw a little bit. I never heard that before. He said, if you draw a little further, God will draw a little further. I've watched Jerry this last year. He drew a little bit. God drew a little bit. He drew a little further. And what was one of his statements tonight? I just want to go all the way to the Lord. And you see the joy of being in the presence of God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Those who stay close to him and draw closer to him will find and know the joy of the Lord. Amen. Our privilege to have Dr. Bishop, Reverend, Holiness of the Air, <laughs> Richard Baird, my, to you he's preacher or Pastor Baird, to he, to me, he's my friend. Well, thank you, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> the only time I've ever written doctor on, a, on a, anything was a check to Dr. Spaulding. He fixed my teeth for $1,400. So, it's okay. Sorry, Dr. Spaulding. There's an echo, so. All right, well, I feel honored. I, I don't know how to follow uh, what just uh, transpired before me, but I'll, I'll give it a try, and uh, we'll just trust the Lord for it. it when uh, Pastor John asked me to share this message that I shared with uh, the men, it was it's kind of developed towards the men in the Tidewater Baptist thing on, on something about uh, mentoring and discipleship, which is very important in the church. And uh, we're just going to, I'm just going to adjust it to, to uh, y'all. I, I don't like reruns. Who likes reruns? I, I like Rifleman. I could watch those all day. But <laughs> preaching, I don't like doing reruns. But I'm going to try. Okay? Because it, it's, it's written for a specific time. But right now it's written for you. And uh, it's called, the title of this message is Looking for Someone. God's always looking for someone. And uh, before I get started, I'm going to just go ahead and pray. 
and uh, ask the Lord to help me. And uh, we'll just go through this. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that moves in our hearts and minds and draws us closer to you as you draw closer to us. And we just thank you for the forgiveness of sins and that uh, we could just have that cleansing power that gives us the ability to come before your throne of grace with, without any impalements or hindrances. Father, thank you for your word. I ask you to help me uh, preach it. May your Holy Spirit continue to fill me and let me uh, be used by you in uh, teaching your word. Thank you for these people that have come on a Sunday night to hear the truth. May I always uh, share that with them because you are full of grace and truth. And may we apply what we've learned tonight to our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to get started. Uh, uh, let's go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 19. Yes, we're, we're going to start out in the Old Testament and find ourselves in the New Testament. Exodus 19, verse 5, it states this, now, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar pe treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And that peculiar treasure is a, is, is, is a, is a special treasure. You're special. If, if you do what? Uh, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. Treasure unto who? Unto God Himself. And He thinks you're special. You know, when we're, we're created in the image of God, man was, but uh, we're His workmanship. We are His masterpiece. That's what that word workmanship means. He's created in you a masterpiece. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You have the power, the same power that created the heavens and the earth, dwelling in you, making you already a new creation in Christ. Isn't that something to be uh, amen and about? And that's what we need. We need to understand that we have that power. So when we're looking at Exodus, we have Moses. We have Moses and he's kind of like us. He likes things fast. Uh, I grew up with fast cars. I didn't own one, but I rode in a few. I had friends that had a 69 Camaro with wheelie bars on the back. And you go down 223rd Street like this. And you hang on and he'll put a $20 bill on, his, on the dashboard. That was a lot of money back in 1977. You could buy a lot of stuff with that. You could almost buy a TV with that. But he put that $20 bill on the dashboard and said, Okay, Rich, when I say go, try to grab it. No seat belts. Remember, no seat belts. And we're, he, he just puts it on there and whoo, up we go. And you're trying to reach it because you want it so bad. Uh, you just can't get it. I grew up near a Lion's Drag Strip. Any of you old groupies remember Lion's Drag Strip? None of you guys, because you're from the East Coast, right? How about uh, Ascot Raceway? Ascot was a, a lot of Gidget movies were filmed at Lions Drag Strip and, and uh, Ascot Raceway, where they had all these fun things. So if you want to watch a, if you want to see Lions Drag Strip, watch a Gidget movie, but check it out. It was a great place to grow up. 50 cents for all day racing and watch these funny cars go down the road. So I grew up with, with speed. And when you live with speed, you want things to happen real fast. And, and Moses here, he, he finds himself in a rush. Uh, Moses, Moses is no different than anybody else. He, he tried to speed up God's will for him. He knew what God's will for him was, but he tried to speed it up on an accelerated pace where that he did what? He killed an Egyptian to try to free the uh, Israelites from the bondage of Egypt. He tried to speed up uh, God's will for Israel by doing that. He, uh, he had to wait 40 years to be used of the Lord, and then he ended up, uh, what do you call that? A has-been shepherd. 
and he, uh, but he followed, he followed the Lord, and in God's timing, he brought him to the people of Israel to lead those people out of bondage. So that's what life is all about. There's always somebody in front of you to assist you to get out of bondage. I remember as a young man, I was in bondage to drugs and alcohol. I, you know my testimony. But there was an old man, Herb McCann, and he, he decided to be someone who cared about me. And he, he mentored me for a year or so, and then we, we just uh, got along great. And he was a fellow carpenter, so he understood where I was coming from. But as we look at the, the nation of Israel, uh, they exited Egypt with a bang. They cleaned them out. If you read the, with all the stuff that they took, they even brought wood. Man, yeah, wood's heavy. They stole the Egyptians' wood. They stole their oil. They stole their food. They didn't steal it. They were given it, right? They didn't steal it. Forgive me, Lord. They gave the, the Egyptians just said, here, take it, go. You got my gold. You, got my, you might as well just have everything and take my wood. So they, they, here's the people of Israel uh, leaving out a nation. They followed the cloud by day and the fire by night. And the Egyptian army was uh, defeated at the Red Sea by a miraculous miracle, even with them just crossing the sea and then the water caving in on the Egyptians. But the people sang unto the Lord. They sang... Uh, unto the Lord on the greatness of God as we, we're going to progress through for about next uh, 12 chapters. They pro, they, when they got on the other side of the Red Sea and the, the, the uh, Egyptian army was wiped out, uh, they sang praises to the Lord, but God provided 12 uh, wells for one for each tribe, 12 wells of water on the other side in the middle of the desert for them to be refreshed after a great victory that who did? That the Lord did. So God gave them water. He gave them manna from heaven. But they still started to complain and murmur. And they ended up eating too much quail. And they all got sick. A lot of them got sick. And judgment came. So a lot of them died because they were complaining and murmuring. But this, this is kind of like our Christian walk. As we look at it, we see our walk happening. So here they are in the wilderness. And and God is not messing around. God don't mess around. I found, I found God, he is faithful. You give him a little bit, he's going to give you a lot. And when he gives you a lot, we need to be ready. Uh, I'm, I'm not qualified to be doing this. You ask, when does the fear go away, Jerry? It never goes away, my friend. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> you just, you, you, you're just fearful. But it's what God wants, and you just do it. It doesn't go away. So God's not messing around because, hey, they, he gave them water from a rock. They had a war with Amalek, and, and leadership was developed. And here they go. They stop at Mount Sinai in chapter 31. Go ahead and turn to 31 in Exodus, verse 11. And I, w I was intrigued with this section of Scripture when I came across it in my, my devotions for the month of, uh, well, it's just chronological reading. But in, I came through Exodus. I was intrigued because I can relate to some of these guys here. Craftsmen are employed. Okay, Moses is up on the mountain. Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting instructions for a tabernacle, getting instructions for how the people are going to live. Uh, the people of God already received, uh, they already received orally from God himself the Ten Commandments. They weren't written down on stone. Moses up there, he's getting all this stuff. And here we go, we're here in chapter 31, craftsmen are to be employed. And cha uh, chapter 31, 1 to 11, it says this, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezaziel, Bezael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. 
And I filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all matter of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Um, and I behold, I have given with him um, Aholiab, the son of, uh, what's his name? I wrote it down. Oh, there it is. Uh, Aliza, Aliza Muck, uh, 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 his Muck, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise hearted. I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat and that thereupon and the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and, its, and his furniture and the pure candlestick with all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings with all his furniture, the laver and his foot and the clothes of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do. So here's Moses, he's a what? He's a shepherd. And God has just given him all these instructions on how to build the tabernacle and I'm sure in his humanity he was going like, yeah right, I, there's no way I could get this. There's no way I'm going to remember this. So God encourages them that there's these two, this one, these two fellas here that are going to do it for them. So he doesn't have to remember that. But Moses was a brilliant man. He was able to remember all these things that the Lord told him, and, and he was blessed. I was looking at this name, uh, Bezael. It means in verse, in verse 2, Bezael, the son of Uri, of the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. His, his name means in the shadow or protection of God. So here's somebody who's been ordained to do something, and he's in the shadow and protection of God. And this, is, this fella here, Hur, of the tribe of Judah, is Moses' brother-in-law. So it's like a family going on here. But he's in the shadow of, uh, or protection of God, and they're just, then you look at the next fella down here, uh, Holiab. Uh, his, means, his name means, here you go, his name means the tent of the father. They didn't even know they were going to get hired. But they have the right names. If you look at the name of her, that means he's here. Here. That's what his name means, here. Where, where was her? He was up on top of the mount, and he held up Moses' arm with Aaron. So that's how close he was to Moses. And it's all family. It's family. God's people is one big family. You're my family. I feel comfortable here. I feel honored to just to come here, but I feel comfortable here because you're my family. But here's her, uh, uh, the father-in-law, uh, his brother-in-law of Moses. And they're all here, and they have names that fit the part. But they, you know what? Where is Moses? He's up on top of the mount, Mount Sinai. And he's up there for a long time. The elders are waiting at the bottom. And he went up there, and he got all these instructions. He was gone a long time. And during this time, he receives uh, more instructions from the Lord. He receives some really special instructions, and that is to build the tabernacle for God. And Moses has been an Egyptian, but as Israel, as an Israelite, he's still a smelly old shepherd. He's still a smelly old shepherd. He's meek, but very intelligent. God tells Moses he's empowered these two fellows, as we read in, in 31. And Moses is away from for a long time. And as he, he's up on the mount, guess what happens down in the camp? Sin enters the camp. Chapter 35. Sin en enters the camp, but not in 35. 
uh, sin enters the camp in chapter 32 where they build this golden calf. Moses has these two test of tablets of stones. He gets kind of upset, uh, destroys them, but the idolaters were slain in verse, 20, in, in verse 25 of 32. So all these people that were doing naughty before the Lord, God cleansed the camp. He knows how to clean house. So all these people that were being naughty, God got rid of them real quick. And you know what? He used other believers to, to slay these folks for the purity of the church, uh, purity of Israel, the nation. But here we go. He's here. And in chapter 35, God gives them back. The stones in chapter 35, verse 30 to 35. Guess what's going to happen? And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship and to devise curious works to the work in gold and in silver and brass and the cutting of stones to set them and to set them and in carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. So and he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholab, the son of Ahizamak of the tribe of Dan, and then hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workmanship, workmen and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and in fine linen and in the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning works. I, I was a contractor. I built things. But you know what? They built this temple, this tabernacle in six months. And erected it in six months. And, you know, don't tell me my job's going to, what I'm going to do five years from now. Tell, just give me the blueprints for what I'm going to do next week. And I'll be able to fulfill that task. But if you're going to ask me to build something in the future, I have no clue. But I don't want to know about that. But here's Moses. Uh, and um, he has these men. And these men didn't know that they were chosen to be used by God. They didn't know until who? Verse 30, And Moses said unto the children of Israel, Hey, check those guys out. There's Beazil, the son of Uri. He's going to build the tabernacle with Aholiab, and they're going to build the tabernacle for God, and he's going to have his presence with us. And these fellows didn't know that that was their task. They had to be what? They were discipled by God himself. When it says it down there that he, uh, verse 35, them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and cunning things. Let me see. No, I'm sorry. Uh, in verse 34, and he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab and Ahizamah of the tribe of Dan. God was going to teach these guys, but it took Moses to say, hey, it's, you're the man. You're the man. And what it is, is I'm trying to bring it up. Sometimes our pastors, I remember when I first started my Christian walk, my hair wasn't even grown out yet. I was one of those guys with an asymmetrical haircut way before these, anybody else. I had like short hair, long hair, all kinds of hair. It was hair. But you know, I got saved in my room in the middle, in, in the middle of the night all by myself. And I found myself in a Baptist church two weeks later, and within a month, I was, within, within weeks, I was being baptized. And guess what? The first words out of my mouth were the next Sunday morning after I was baptized. Hey, anybody want to disciple me? Hey, pastor, can you, would you like to disciple me? You know what he said? Bet you can't guess. He didn't say Yes. He said, no, hey, Herb, here's this kid. He wants to be a disciple. Would you do it? Would you disciple this kid? Like, he had no faith in me. But Herb did. 
And as I've shared with John years ago, when he was trusting the Lord to start your uh, FBI ministry, where you're studying out of the, uh, what is that, Wilmington Study Guide to the Bible, that's what Herb took me through. It's a good program. Herb didn't know that someone else was thinking about writing it down. And here we go. I'm here. So I, I was discipled for about a year. Then I, I backslid. So I went walking back into the wilderness. And the Lord decided to utilize that time for growth. But here we go. Let's go ahead and uh, look at uh, 2 Chronicles 16.9. Second Chronicles 16.9, one of my, uh, we're going to look at 16.9a, okay? Because B gets kind of a little, little uh, not too comfortable for most of us because God checks us all out. Uh, Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. And that's who he shows himself strong to. Like, like, we, like uh, I just got that message about drawing near to God and he'll draw near to you. I just figured that one out recently and I've been saved 27 years. 28, I don't know how long I've been saved. I just figured it out. 27 years, no. It's going on 32, 31 or so, I don't care. It's been fast. Man, yeah, being in God's will, life has gone by real fast. It's already March. And here we go. We're just moving along. But um, I just learned that drawing near to God and he'll draw near to you. I learned the philosophy of that, just the, the teaching of that just this past year, in 2020. Because we all needed to draw closer to the Lord. And we did. And the church is strong. My little fledgling church over there at South Key, we're strong. I brag about them. We're, at, we're in, a, in a, a change time at our church. But the, the people that are there are strong. So we as believers, we always must look and encourage others to do what? To be disciple. You, you, you know Jesus Christ for a little longer than a brand new Christian. You could mentor them. You could teach them. You could help them in their Christian walk. But as we go along in this walk, we need to know who, who do we disciple? What kind of people do we disciple? Well, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. What kind of people do we disciple? Are we to be picky? I'm sorry, John, but I really need this. I don't normally drink in the pulpit. It's probably my third time in four years or so. I won't put it next to yours. All right, who do we disciple? You want to know who do we disciple? Or who, who needs any help in the Christian walk? Anyone who asks. Anybody. Even an unsaved man. I worked in construction pretty much my whole life other than my military career. That's where I lived. There's unsaved men. Unsaved men discipled me. They talked to me about things. As an unsaved man, because I asked questions. They were kind. They gave me biblical answers. I listened. But here we go. Uh, I worked in Florida. I discipled my men that worked with me. They were unsaved. They knew if they asked me a question, I was going to give them the word of God. And I said, well, you know who I'm going to point you to. Do you still want to hear it? Oh, yeah, I need something now. My world's crumbling. And people are all around you, saved and unsaved. Who do you disciple? You, you, you disciple anyone who asks, uh, anyone who says yes when you ask them. Was that pastor right in passing me on to Herb? I really wanted to be discipled by him. My pastor, because I looked up to him. He was the first one. But he passed me on to someone who was like-minded like me. He knew where I was coming from. So our classes were, what, 
where I was coming from, off the streets. So uh, as we go on here, uh, Paul had his Timothy. Uh, Paul sat under Gamaliel and bragged about it. So Paul was discipled. Timothy was discipled by Paul. And in ver verse 3, uh, we need to know what did Paul have to encourage Timothy all about in this Christian discipleship stuff or this mentorship that's going on? He had to do what? I thank God whom I served from my forefathers with pure conscience that, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my heart, in my prayers, night and day. He had to encourage Timothy, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm from a place where if you ask people, that they'll, they'll say yes or no. In, La, in Florida or Los Angeles, they'll, they'll say yes or no. They'll answer you no or they'll answer you yes. But here in Virginia, I learned something. I spent four years in the pulpit asking people, would you like to be discipled? Would you like to be mentored? And you know what? I never got a response. Yeah, I never got a response. A new man in the church. I just started praying for him. I've been praying for him for long before he even came to our church. About since the time I showed up, I've been praying for him that he'd come to our church. So because God had a pl has a plan for that young man. And I told him, I said, hey, I'm done asking from the pulpit. I'm going to go face to face with this guy, man to man, and ask him, Hey, would you like to be discipled? And you know what his eyes lit up? He says, yes. I've been waiting seven years for someone to ask me that question. Just to ask him that question. And he said, yes. And we meet at his convenience. And you know what time that is? Seven o'clock in the morning I'm preaching and teaching to this fellow. And that's the time he can meet. And I told him, I said, I'll meet you at 4.30 a.m. if that's the case. Because they know what it is to be under somebody. When I, got, when I got back from my backsliding experience, I went to my pastor. I said, uh, Pastor uh, Bill, I says, uh, I've been backsliding. I don't, I don't know what to do. He says, uh, uh, would you like to go to Bible college? First thing out of it, he didn't say, well, forget about the sin. He said, well, there's no sin in your life, Rich. Would you like to go to Bible college? It starts in two weeks. What do you see in me? What do you see in me? I just came back off the streets, and he's offering me uh, the opportunity to go to Bible college. What do you see? You don't know what we see. There's a diamond in the rough on every one of us. But God has something for every one of us. But it starts with what? Learning the word of God and being mentored by somebody. And he mentored me. He didn't have time to go into deep theological things. But he had time to, oh, hey, it's raining outside. I can't go to the work, Pastor Bill. Would you like to have breakfast with me? And we'd meet at, the, uh, we had a place called Sambo's. You remember Sambo's? Yeah, Sambo's with a little tiger and a little kid. Yeah, I'm dating myself. But we, we still had one of those Sambo's in Los Angeles off of Carson Street. And we'd meet there and we'd have breakfast. And I'd ask them these great, important questions. What was God's will for your life today, Pastor uh, Bill? And he'd, he'd tell me straight out, having breakfast with you. My day's shot after I'm with you because uh, breakfast with me and, and a, hungry la a hungry young man to hear the word of God, you're talking three, four hours. And we'd sit in Zambos and have coffee and eat breakfast. So it might take a little time on your part. You, you as the uh, discipler, take a little time on your part. When I meet my friend, uh, discipling him, we start at 7, we end at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Most of the time. It's fun. And, and you'll find it fun. So uh, I had to be praying for this young man. Pray for somebody. Before you ask them. 
<laughs> Ask the Lord to soften their heart. And as we, you go along, what's the next thing you, you, you're going to do? And he says this uh, in verse 4 of 2 Timothy 1. Uh, greatly desiring to see thee. Man, I want to see you. I love seeing you. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, he had to encourage Timothy that he was, uh, he's praying for him. He wanted to see him. And he, and he had to tell him here, hey, your faith is genuine. In verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unframed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's also in thee. You're saved. I know you're born again. I was there. I led you to Christ, Timothy. I know your salvation is genuine. And you know, you just check first. That's the first thing you check. And your salvation is genuine. Uh, and you know what? Here's the next thing. Uh, you have a special gift. In verse 6, it says this, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on of my hands. You know, he, Timothy had a special gift. What did someone see in me? I don't know, but maybe they knew something was up that I didn't. I didn't know God was going to challenge me to uh, finish Bible college and go to, on the mission field and get married to my wife and go back to Bible college and then uh, just do all this stuff. I didn't know that. But it happened day by day. What? It's in that progressive sanctification that you just want to get closer to the Lord. You know, not every day has been peachy, but every day has been a blessing. I remember not having wonderful days, but here you go. You stir up that special gift in you, Timothy. And here you go. Here, verse 7. For God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. You know what? God's people are paralyzed because that spirit of fear is mental. It's mental. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. We've taken fear, the tremor part, and converted, we need to convert it into reverence for God. Satan doesn't want you to have reverence for God, that fear of God. He doesn't want you to have that. He wants you to have the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown is scary. How many times have I sold all my stuff and followed the Lord? Probably about five times. Everything. And it hadn't gotten easier. That's how he moves. It's scary to be walking with the Lord, but that's not the fear we want. We want to turn that fear of tremor, tremor into reverence to God and say, Yes, Lord, what do you have for me? I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. And what does he want all of us to be like his son, Jesus? Amen. Amen. That's, right. that's all he has for you. Are you going to be obedient all the way unto death with the joy waiting before you when you get to the end of the line? Thou uh, enter into my rest, thou good and faithful servant. Come on in. Nothing's going to harm you until you, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Nothing's going to bother you. There's no fear in that. Your fear of security is all found in Christ. Our reverence of security is all found in Christ. So he says this, uh, don't be fearful. There's power in what you're doing in verse, se in verse 7. There, but, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I was in Papua New Guinea. I was in Papua New Guinea, uh, a carpenter. Carpenters are missionaries too. I was there for a few months. But in about the second month in, I already saw these fire walkers who walked in fire and they didn't get burned. The fire was not consuming them. You see something like that and you know those people who have asked for missionaries to come and translate the Word of God in their language and just share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and yet 
no missionaries were available to go. And you just look at them, and these men were engulfed in a flame at least 20 feet high, standing in the fire. No asbestos fire suits. They're just bare skin. Bare skin. Standing in the fire. There's power in, in seeing something like that. It would change your direction. But you know what? A lot, of, a lot of our friends and our families and our co-worker, all these people are going to be standing in the fire and not being consumed by it, but they're going to be in hell and be tormented the rest of their life. Are you going to go? There's power. You have in you, you have that power in you. And, and as I was listening to Jer Jerry give his testimony and Brian and Eli, it's just the power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where it's all at. Amen. You, you and I are li living, well, let me see. We're freed from the bondage of sin and death, but we are resurrected beings. What more could you want? You've been raised from the dead. Amen. What more do you want? So you have that power available. And you know what? It's the love of God that's going to motivate you to do anything for Him. Even when you're dead and gone and you're in eternity, and you're, you're going to be dwelling in what? God's love. God's love is there all the time. And he's, that's where you're going to be dwelling. Check it out. When you get, when your body and your spirit all meet together and after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ and you're put on this earth to, to your, the new heaven and the new earth where there's no more sin, no more tears, no more death, no more nothing, you're going to be already in the presence of God's love continually. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For who? Put your name in there. For God so loved hey, Richard Baird. What a bozo, but he loved me. And that's what he wants from you and I, that we'd understand that there's love. And there's knowledge in knowing that you've done your, what you're doing in giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ is right. Of sound mind. It's the right thing to do. Though it's very difficult to take your family to different places in the world or just even moving them from Florida up to here to serve the Lord here in the land of the unknown to us. But you know what? Someone asked, they always ask me, how'd you find this church out there? 246 years our church has been in existence. 246 years, South Key Baptist Church. I don't even think I've been saved 246 months. You know, but we've been, it's been around a long time. Why? Because there's always been men and women to shine the light of Jesus Christ in that community. And right now, we're pretty close to only maybe three churches in that area that actually preach the gospel. Three. Three churches that preach the gospel. And you know what? As I said when I came in the door, I don't want to lose, I don't want the doors to close on our watch. And when I say our, the woman in the back, our watch. We're serving the Lord so, so much there. And you know what? We have to understand that it's all about God's power. It's all about his love. And we're doing the right thing because you know what? Lives are going to be changing. And they're changing daily. And you know what? I tell my people, we're, we're learning in the book of Acts. The book of Acts only has really three points. God's people need to be unified. And then God will magnify them before the world. And then he'll multiply them. And bringing God's, what God has chosen to be his people in your house. And you know what? We had the best celebration today. 
246 years of that church is in existence. But we had the best celebration where the Spirit of God dwells in all the people there. And you know what? That is a sweet and smelling savor before the Lord. Amen. It's as if you just took the, the, the wine and poured it on the altar on top of all that beautiful fat up there and just let it go. The Spirit of God was there in that little fellowship hall that we have. And then he said he had to instill into Timothy this in verse 9. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor for me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When, when did you get your grace? Before the world began. We must, we must. Paul took Timothy right here. I'm going to change it a little bit. Paul took Timothy from that mercy part of our relationship to God, which you've been what? Freed from the penalty of sin to that progressive relationship with God that you've been freed from the power of sin. Now get going, Timothy. You went from mercy to grace. And when you get from that baby Christian side of mercy, which for by grace we have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, but it's, it's something that is going to get you to the next level, is you got to go from mercy to grace and all things I could do in Christ Jesus who strengthened me. All things. You could do it all. Maybe you've got to study if you're not going to take a test. But you could do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthened you. So he's telling Timothy, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Uh, hey, Timothy, plan on suffering. Plan on suffering. You, you want to be a real good Christian? You're going to suffer. We, we, we're kind of pansies here in the United States. We don't know what suffering is. But you know what? You, you better. You better. We better. We all better. Build a foundation on our children that when suffering and, and persecution comes, they'll be ready and not flee like cockroaches when you turn the light on in the kitchen. Because it's coming, folks. It's coming. We need to teach them to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And you know what? You know how they're going to see it? Through you. And as we go in this journey, verse 12 says, Follow me as I follow after Christ. And you know what? In verse 8 he says, You have immortality. If God be for us, who can be against us? And Christ is coming soon. And Timoth uh, Paul says to him in verse 12, he says, For which for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And you know what? Paul, Paul tells Timothy, this is what I've done. I've committed myself. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to all who have believed, whom I have believed and am persuaded. Are you pers persuaded that he's able to keep you? Amen. He is. Right. I'm 230 pounds, I found out the other day. He's keeping me. I haven't missed a meal ever. <laughs> we had fried, so much fried chicken at our potluck today, you could eat it like quail. But he keeps us. He loves you. He wants you. He wants you to believe. He wants you to know. He wants you to go and follow him always. As Paul writes in verse 40, 14, he says, The Holy Spirit is in you. You have the power. Let's read it. Verse 14, he says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, Keep by the Holy Ghost what dwells in you. He dwells in you. Keep them. Feed them. You know what he eats? You know what he cares about? Your mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what he wants. 
And you know what? There's nothing wrong with living in the power of God. No, nothing wrong with living in the love of God. Nothing wrong in knowing and understanding that what you're doing is right. It's the right thing to do. So, um, thank you so much. I have no more to say. I could keep going, but I'm one of them. Thank you very much. God bless you.
they hear the gospel, they'll go off. And they go on and write all sorts of things. Boy, we pray. Pray that promise and live that you will draw closer to us, too. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the many things you do every day in us. Our hearts are just overflowing. Thank you for the time that we can to pray. Thank you, Lord, for this church and these dear people. We're going to praise your name.